Whether or not this year is our year is still very much up in the air. The team has rebounded so well from the quick rebuild on the fly, and we're still having players progress and actually make their way into the team. It's obviously exciting to be here in the second round to be playing the Los Angeles Kings, who are heavily favored over us. But whether or not we find success here, it would be nice. It'd be amazing for this to be our year and to finally get our hands on the cup, to get back to the Stanley Cup final, where we fell short a long time ago at this point. But I want to mention something else, and it's a conversation that was brought up after the last episode, of course, where we ended up having to witness a lot of poor AI gameplay. The roster editing spectacular is basically done. As far as everything I'm doing with overalls, potentials, adding people to the game, it's all done. What I'm trying to do now is carve out a strong slider set that results in more realistic point totals and stuff like that. So I wanted to bring that up because that'll more than likely start to affect the new series once this is over, once Vegas is over. But I wanted to bring that up. As far as what happened last episode with that gameplay, I don't think we'll see the same thing. I'm going to continue to do that. But in the future on this channel, unless of course we go to overtime in this playoff run or before this series ends... I don't think we'll be seeing that poor of AI gameplay again. So that is something else to look forward to alongside that roster editing spectacular. The video will be dropping sometime this week alongside, of course, the 50 plus page Google Doc of notes and that slider set as well. There's a lot to look forward to, including this series right here. Now, you will not be surprised to know that I have made changes to the lineup. That said, let's take a look before we get a look at the LA Kings. We have called up some of the highest performing players from the Duel of Narwhals and given them an opportunity. The top six remains the same with Macaulay, Ivanov, and Steven Morose. That has not changed. The second line, we've moved Henry Yang to left wing, but he's still the same player type. Nothing's changed with Bachman. Ralph Ricci is now going to be a two-way rather than a power forward. I don't want his game to center around uh, the physical nature, despite that physical category being ridiculous. I'm intrigued to see what he can do, and hopefully that doesn't ruin his offense. But, I mean, if Ivanov can put up five points as a two-way, why can't Ricci continue to do the same thing as a two-way? If anything, it might help him be a little bit more offensive. I hope. Maybe he'll stay out of the box, even though he didn't go all that often. The third line is where we see our first change. Stefan Vineau. It's a French name. You know that I'm going to botch it. Is killing it right now with North Bay, or was. Seven points in five games. He has an unbelievable shot, and just in general is another very well-rounded offensive player. He was a third-round pick in 2033. I'm intrigued to see what he can do. He is with Kim Nylander, who has been changed to a playmaker, and Jean-Francois is now a two-way, which I know is a bit weird, but as a playmaker, he's not exactly putting up a ton of assists. So, trying some different things on that third line. The two other new faces are Ryder McCammond, who is one hell of a playmaker, at least in terms of puck skills. The offensive awareness is a bit low. He is centered by Keith Hartnell, who, you know, attribute-wise, isn't looking the best, but he is someone who is also doing well. Seven points in five games in the AHL playoffs thus far. And then Brian Borough. It came down to him and Thomas Nylander for who gets to stay into the lineup. And, I mean, we're going to give the 85 overall the opportunity to get the job done. Defensively, there is also a change as Landon McCult has been called up. He was the best performing defenseman on North Bay. Pat Ling was struggling a little bit, so we've dropped him down. Sergei Nachushkin has been changed to a defensive D-man. Basically, what we've done is defensive D-man, either two-way or offensive D-man. As we get to the second pairing, OFD and Francois, Henry Shattenkirk, now a defensive D-man. And then, of course, Zeeler, who's been an offensive D-man, with McPherson, who's been changed to a defensive. He's up to an 87, which is nuts. The goaltending is still the same. We hope that Torsten Ackerlund can get the job done for us. We barely snuck past Anaheim. It took that crazy overtime to actually get us here. Whether or not we should be in this spot, who knows? We might be facing a very demoralizing victory, or maybe we can pull off one hell of an upset. Let's look at the opposition as it stands. The Los Angeles Kings... And they have two players, but one in particular, who has been dominating the league since he's been drafted. That would be Alex Grenier, who had seven points in five games. 
a former number one overall pick. And we've seen his name pretty much every, well, quite a few of the years. Actually, in fairness, he's dropped down a little bit. But you see those first couple of years he was in the league. I mean, just dominant. Absolutely dominant. On that top line with Chris Lindros, the 34-year-old, who was a number two overall pick. He was the man selected after God. Who went first in 2019? Who went first? It was Dylan Redden, wasn't it? 2018? Did Redden go year two? Technically the year one draft? I don't even remember at this point, man. It's been so long. Obviously the extra 2018 draft was the Fragapani draft. But it's tough to remember at this point. Pascal Duchesne, a former second round pick, rounds out the top line. Second line is Ilya Kozlov, a former number two overall pick by Ottawa. So he was selected after Fragapani, which is nuts. Uh, Mr. Odorais. 20th overall selection in 2023 by Edmonton and Vili Heinonen. 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 Fourth overall pick in 2022. They have a lot of players from other teams. Rob Rankin is with Eve LeClaire and Camden Gentile. The fourth line, Norm McCutcheon with Mario Sivret and Tyson Greentree. Defensively, Jesus, help me. Help me, Lord. <laughs> Maurice Marchand, who has been unbelievable. An old face in Mr. Anthony Rokon, who went in the 2022 draft, which is why I don't quite remember. Has no points thus far. Cameron Hines, a former fifth overall pick of San Jose. My God, they just, they've just they just collected all the best talent from every other team. <laughs> Quincy Sanford's there. Another former first-round pick. Third pairing of Alexander Kabanov and, or, yeah, that'd be Kabanov, I guess, Kabanov. Uh, with Yves Boussieris, another former first-round pick from a different team. The goaltender is Jerome Goudreau, and that's our one opening, is that they don't have the highest overall goalie, but as we've learned, that doesn't mean a damn thing in this game. Healthy scratches of Ole Kuka, Christian Veselainen, and Braylon Belfour. Let's get this series underway, shall we? There's not much else to say. There's not much else to do except face this, uh, like, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the perfect way to describe it. it it's just we're, we're facing a nearly unconquerable challenge. An unconquerable challenge. That's a word, right? Like, I'm having, like I feel like if we had to equate this, it's like I got I to gotta climb the wall from Game of Thrones with nothing, just my bare hands. It's like, that's not going to go well. At least give me a, an ice pick or something. Anything. I don't know. You get the point. I feel like we're going to lose. But we'll see what happens. First period of game one here in L.A. And the Kings take the early lead. It's Duchesne with the goal. We actually outshot them, but barely. It didn't matter. Second period. Now getting nervous. Anthony Rokon scores his first goal of the postseason. We still have these slight edge in shots, but the Kings are up by two. Do we have what it takes? Duchesne scores on the power play. Do we have what it takes to get a goal? Uh, against an 85 overall goalie. Shouldn't be all that difficult. Thus far, it's proving to be. The good thing is we're not getting killed in terms of shots. We just haven't been able to find the back of the net. And it's not looking like we're going to. They get the shutout in game one. Where are we getting shots from? A lot of outside shots. A lot of outside shots in that period. We... We didn't get any net front traffic. At all. At all. We are not going to win unless we get a tad bit physical and get some of that net front traffic. Goodrow with a 32 save shutout. Of course, there has long been the debate over whether or not strategies and, of course, sliders affect in game when you just sim. It does. At least this year it does. Prior years I had my doubts. This year it matters. As far as the team is concerned, uh, right now we're set up to turtle, apparently. Uh, no, we're, we're going to be aggressive. We are going to be aggressive. Let's go. I let's just, We're going to outwork them. We are going to outwork them. That is what I want. Although, granted, the AI don't exactly forecheck too well anymore, especially with how Hut worked last year, so they kind of nerfed it. I want us to be aggressive, but I also want us to trap. It's kind of a tough call. Maybe we'll just change up the offensive strats. That that seems about right. That seems about right. Okay, so, knowing that, 
Uh, let's yeah, let's take good old strong movement. Carry the puck in. Blue to blue. Eh, blue to blue works. Let's just set this up and hope for the best. Offensively, the overload's clearly not working. We'll go crash the net. And again, high energy. Just make it happen. Make it happen. Just get people in front. Screw it. All this actually looks relatively okay. Just make it happen. Screw it. <laughs> we'll see if that does anything. Just start getting in front of goal. All of these outside shots. Of course, there's no way to tell if there was someone screening the goalie on that attempt. But clearly, a lot of shots from the outside. And that is not going to be our way to success. Now, the other thing to note is that North Bay are currently in the second round of the playoffs. They swept Belleville, and they're currently up 2-1 to one on Utica, despite the continual lineup changes. That said, anybody we do send down is typically going to be good enough to replace who we called up anyway. So, we should be alright. Game 2, let's do this. First period, and we're on the board. Nice change. We did get outshot, but Jean-Francois has his first goal of the postseason. We're up one to nothing. Second period... Didn't last long. Gentile with the goal. 23 shots to 18. We're still out shooting them despite working a trapping strategy. Can we get the job done here? You know what's funny though? If we were working this trap strategy, I don't recall in our gameplay the AI trapping. I recall our guys forechecking. Am I just misremembering how the overtime of last game went? Because it took for goddamn ever. Then again, most of it was penalty kill. Oh my god. Okay, two goals in a minute. Most of it was on the kill. Jesus, Torsten! What is going on? We get one goal in two games, and this is going about as poorly as one could have expected. Damn it. I forgot to see where we were getting shots from, too. Four unanswered goals for the Los Angeles Kings, a three-point night for Gentile, and we have had absolutely no answer for Goodrow. And needless to say, I'm a little bit afraid. Now, if this works as most series works, we'll have a tied-up series. Or we're going to get swept at this rate. I don't know what's worth changing up, if anything. The team as it stands is probably the team at its best. Maybe not in terms of overall, but in terms of players who have been performing. It's a tough call. That third line's been very ineffective. And Brian Boro's still been pretty bad. So let's... Probably make a switch here. It's kind of a tough call. Let's swap Francois and Boro. I know Francois scored, but still, I feel like a change there could work. And as far as this other line is concerned, it's a tough call. It's a tough call. I think we keep the top six the same. Defensively, Top pairing, second pairing have been completely useless, so we'll swap Shattenkirk and McPherson. And in terms of goal tending, Mateo Fox is going to get the chance. It's what kind of led us out of the, the Anaheim threat that we were under, got us back into the series. Mateo Fox starts game three here on home ice. We are in desperate need of a win. We have one goal through 120 minutes of play. Things need to change. First period is scoreless. We crushed them. 16 shots to 5. And we just don't have an answer for this team. For this goaltender in particular in Goodrow. Second period. We do get on the board. It's Kim Nylander. Still not a single goal from that top line. 26 shots to 13. We have them doubled up. We're up by 1. As we head into the third period, we need a goal so desperately insurance power play Stephen Moreau's and there's the top liner delivering we have doubled our goal output from the series in game three alone as Leclerc scores 709 left do we have what it takes to hold on for the win three minutes left can Mateo Fox shut the door from here yes he can Near shutout for Mateo Fox. 24 of 25 stopped. We outshot them 38 to 25, and we take the game 2 to 1. Goodrow is a wall of a goaltender. See, the Game of Thrones reference checks out. Mateo Fox over the great game. Kim Nylander with a two point night. Morose's goal holds up as the winner. And indeed, the home team 
has yet to lose, which is pretty nice. What's the standing right now in North Bay Series? 2-all. So, very big game. Actually, the results? 3-2. Never mind. So, North Bay, one win away from the conference final. We'll keep our eyes out on that. For now, the only thing to do is just to make sure that Mateo Fox is in net for Game 4. As crazy as that is, it's almost like fighting fire with fire as the Blues are also one win away from punching their ticket to the conference final. It's like fighting fire with fire at this point. We just, we, you know, it's like, oh, you want to run an 85 goalie, not a 90? We'll run a 77, and we'll see what happens. So, Mateo Fox is the man in goal for Game 4. Let's see what we can do. Can we tie this series up, or will we be facing elimination in Game 5 back in Los Angeles? First period, and LA has the lead. Gentile scores again. Yet again, we have the advantage in shots, however. Second period happened. Second period happened. Don't think there's too much to talk about, though. What do you think? I think we're good, right? Not much to talk about. Let's let's start the third period. Still down by a goal, as it uh, as it turns out, but I think we're good to move on. Early power play chance goes to waste. 13 minutes left. In regulation, and Grenier makes it five. Lindros makes it six. Oh, Mateo. Mateo, Mateo, Mateo. Autoreus makes it seven. It might, uh, I mean, you'd want to read it as Autoreus, but I do believe it's Autoreus. <sighs> seven to three is the final. And there are levels to this game, is what we're seeing here. Our backs are against the wall. We are down three games to one. We will roll with Ockerland in game five. And we will potentially change some things around out of desperation. I don't believe keeping the old lineups the way they were would have been beneficial because we had underperforming players. But the likes of McCammond and Hartnell. Hartnell's done all right. McCammond's done nothing. Uh, and that third line, plus minus, is brutal. The second line isn't doing that well either. So, yeah, changes changes have to be made. So Francois, five points. The plus minus is brutal. Boro has still done absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing throughout this entire postseason run. We'll give him a chance still on the fourth line, even though we know that that combination on the fourth line is completely ineffective. Vino, actually, here you know what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, or we're gonna bump Vino down to the other line, and Thomas Nylander will be back in. Six points for Ricci, seven for Bachman, three for Yang. So I'm thinking Nylander and Yang will be swapped. Nine from Rose, nothing from Ivanov in this series. So the easy change there is Macaulay, Bachman, Morose, Nylander, Ivanov, Ricci, Nylander, Yang, Francois, more than likely. Although Ricci hasn't done much. So you know what? I know Morose has the one goal. Macaulay, Bachman, Francois. Yeah, I think McCauley stays on the top line just for what he did in the regular season. And mainly because I don't trust Kim Nylander. Although. Although. Let's try it. Vienno, Bachman, Francois. McCauley, Ivanov, Morose, I still don't like. So we're going to go Nylander, Ivanov, Morose. No, we're not. We're going to go McCauley, Yang, Morose, Nylander, Ivanov, Ricci. Nylander, Hartnell, Bora. What's the worst that could happen? We lose by more? <laughs> I think we're good. And the plus minus of the top six continues to just get ripped apart. So, I think we're going to go Shattenkirk, Francois as the top pairing. Actually, let's go McPherson, Francois, Shattenkirk, Zeeler, which has never worked. And, uh, yeah. Shattenkirk, McCall, Nachushkin, Zeeler. What's the worst that could happen? Ockerland is back between the pipes. It is game five. The season is on the line. It's a must win. By the way, the North Bay Duel and Narwhal are going to the conference final to take on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. So at the very least, there's a chance for some success 
this season. Whew, but we still have hope here, kind of, not really. <laughs> First period of game five. And the Kings have the early lead. Only six shots in that first period. Lindros scores with 52 seconds remaining. Second period. <sighs> Duchesne and Gentile made it 3-0. Henry Yang gets a goal back. 18 shots to 15. 3-1 on the board. We are in desperate need of a third period comeback. Or this season has come to an end. 12 minutes left here in the series. Grenier scores. That's it. That is it. Barring a miracle comeback, the Kings were just way, way too much for us. Let's just hit the button. It's over. Yeah. Hartnell gets a goal with 303. It wasn't enough. There are levels to this. Los Angeles clearly a step above. We fall in five games to the Kings. And it's certainly a disappointing way for the season to end. Now, again... We still have hope heading into these next few seasons, the final few seasons of this series. You know, we're still looking okay, but it's it's getting to the point now where if someone like Torsten Ackerlund is struggling the way he is, there is room for concern. If you have, I mean, Landon McCult did very well, but with McPherson being like a minus seven, Shattenkirk didn't do anything. That's concerning. Forward-wise, Moreau's nine points. He did okay. I mean, McCauley did okay. Bachman did okay. Ricci, I mean, Ivanov, obviously, just the blooms off the rose for him. And I think, again, if we if we keep him third-line center at best, you know, he's not going to be the guy that we can rely upon to get the job done. We know this. But you also have someone like Henry Yang struggle. Kim Nylander's, well, I mean, five points in 12 games. You talk about his struggles in the regular season. And then Brian Boro was absolutely abysmal absolutely abysmal so there is there is still room to make moves in terms of the personnel we actually use there is still time to sort everything out and be those you know be the contenders that we planned on being here in the final few seasons we have that opportunity on the table we're just not there yet and obviously the club that we have right now isn't going to be the team that gets the job done. As obviously, we just got smoked by Los Angeles. We'll see what happens here with North Bay. A promising chance for them, although it's looking like they're going to fall short as well. They are down three games to one. They do win game five. Can they win in game six? No, they cannot. So, a successful season for the duel in Narwhal. I'll take it. But both seasons come to a close in slightly disappointing fashion. I'm still optimistic for the seasons to come. This draft as well could be quite strong for us, and actually I think I will go through it right now instead of cutting it off as a playoff episode. We've done that before. Caught a few people off guard, especially after an episode like the last one where people are like, oh, it's a late video, you must just be sitting there watching in overtime. Nope, you might miss a draft. North Bay ends up losing, of course, to the eventual cup winner. We'll see what happened around the league, even though a lot of the names aren't, uh... I mean, the names are familiar, but obviously we're very much into nothing but computer-generated territory at this point. New Jersey wins the Cup. Let's take a look here. President's Trophy did go to L.A. Enkvist led the league in points. MVP was Ristolainen. Uh, best defenseman, the Norris, goes to Rene Francois, which is huge for us. Uh, Calder went to Taves in Florida. Any other familiar names? The answer, aside from Matt Barzal winning the Selkie at this point, is no. Any hardware for the duel in Narwhal? Absolutely not. So, there you go. We could look at what New Jersey looks like, but hey, we know what a cup winning teams look like oftentimes. Well, let's get this done. Let's go through this draft. I will save the rest of the offseason, though, for the next episode as Vegas gets the number one pick. So we'll go through the draft here. Next episode will be the rest of the offseason, getting the team set up. And if there are question marks, as Connor McDavid retires, if there are question marks, we'll end it. If it's pretty straightforward in terms of how the team needs to be set up, then we'll just start the season. If anything, sim through the season as Rasmus Dahlin retires. 
He's an 81 overall at 36 years old. A lot of those guys didn't exactly have the point totals that you would have expected them to. And Dylan Strom finishes with more career points than Casey Metalstadt. So there you go, in case you ever want to place a bet there. As we also have quite a, I mean, that's a decent portion of our scouting staff retiring. But here we go. Let's do this. Can we get another strong set of prospects to join this organization? We have the 24th pick. You never know when that's going to be lucky. Number one pick is a medium elite. Oof, it might be. Oh, yeah, it might be a weaker draft. Except for Toronto getting a steal and a half. Jesus, okay. This is this looks like a hit or miss draft, depending on one's opinion. So, uh, let's see. We have Josh Zajac, B's and C's, as a medium four. Zuzin, B's and C's, as a medium six. Ashton, B's and C's, let's be honest, he's probably a medium six as well. Another medium four in Ben. Straight B's and C's. Colin Lowry. Interesting scoring. Higher point totals than anybody else. And I gotta be honest, he would probably be the guy probably be the guy to just take a risk on, if anything. It could completely backfire, but we're at that point. Same with Jackson Nickel. We're at the point where it's like, okay, we could get another medium six, but unless there's someone like Mikhail Bengston and they're not really worth taking the risk on, then yeah, we just go all in, see what happens. And hopefully we can get lucky with one of these other players here. Seth Reichel. Decent point total. B's and C's as well. Um, Matthias Jacobson. JVR comparison. I don't know if I believe that. Uh, the lower lead gem there. Ola Brodine. B's and C's. No guarantees over what he is. Pete Regier. Or Regier, would it be? Might be my favorite right now. Lower lead gem is a decent one. And Danny Claremont. Also looking pretty good. So, odds are, Albert Gunderson, if we could trust that, odds are we're going pretty far off the board with this pick, but we need to. Like I said, now is the time to just, you know, shoot your shot, hope for the best. Although this menu is lagging to death. So, right now, right now, Regier is my favorite. Again, Lowry, strong point total for the 18-year-old, 24th. He's the highest rated guy left from the scouting department. Bankston had a strong shot, but I think I'd rather hope that Lowry's a low elite. That's what it comes down to. It comes down to probably Rije and... The other guy towards the top of the list. Let's take all of these guys off the list so I can get a direct comparison. Let's see what we have here. We got a minute and a half to make this pick. Comes down to one of these two. Obviously, with Colin Lowry, you hope that that's a really strong potential. With Pete Rije, though, is it Rije? It's either Rije or Rije. It's just where the emphasis is. 17 years old, B's and C's, low elite. <sighs> Another defenseman, a forward. Another defenseman, take the risk with the forward who's not as much of a guarantee. <laughs> Who do we have in the system at this point? It's worth double checking. Amongst the goaltenders, we have Connor Walchuk who's going to be our backup this year more than likely in Torsten Ackerland. So goaltending, we're fine. Right? Like It's got to be one of those two to lead the way. Defensively, <laughs> I mean, we're also looking okay with Kolosov, Ling, you got the McCults of the world, Nicholson's still developing, Conacher's there. So, I mean, the defense is really starting to pan out. But in terms of forward prospects on the way up, who do we have? Let's actually sort this by trade value. Who do we have on the way up? Walsh might make it. Sorinen might make it. Uh, Hartnell, of course. Inglis was looking all right. I think we need the forward help more. I think as far as, like, if we're going to have a winning defense, we already have the, the pieces here that would make up that winning defense. We need, to, we need to hope for the best with a forward at this point. So, let's do it. If it comes down to a decent defenseman against a decent forward, we're going for the forward. And we're going to try with Lowry here. He's 18, CHL eligible. Colin Lowry of the Kamloops Blazers is my pick. This could blow up in my face. 
It, I mean, he's a medium 666, right? So the potential's still strong. The overall is still strong. Not a low elite, not a medium elite. Which I don't really know if I could have hoped for that. But I am okay with it. I swear this game is like having a weird bit of lag going on. Holy shit, Colorado, how many picks do you need? Uh, I do want to double check, though. Was he the best player to take? It looks like it, actually. Out of all those forwards, he was the highest overall. Uh, Reichel was there. Van Kattishen. Uh 64 low elite. So, I don't regret it. Claremont was 64 low elite as well. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I mean, in the end, we, again, needed the forward more than the, uh, another defenseman anyway. Jody Conley, no thank you. We have Jonathan Wiseman. I know it's Wiseman, but still. Uh, Jackson Lowe. Don't know if I trust that. A goalie in Frederick Jacobs, which at 19 years old, he might be okay. Another goalie there in uh, Sven Hedstrom, who is going to take forever to develop. Forever, so screw that. Uh, low top four gem. I hate the low top four potential. Yeah, I'm not, well, Smoskowitz is looking okay. And then Lambert is at least an 18-year-old, or a 17-year-old who would have that little bit of extra time to develop. I'm not really won over by anybody yet. Even Darcy Carpenter having that shot. We need something more than that. Or we take a risk with someone else where they might have a higher chance of actually being half-decent. That's what this is about now. I can't take the safe bets. I can't take the guys who, like, oh, well, he's going to have trade value because that doesn't matter to us. We need to take the risk and hopefully hit the jackpot with some of these picks. La Perriere? La Perriere? Not quite that. What about Maurice Henrique? Also not quite that from the looks of it. Uh, Kim Johansson? Not quite. Another set of goalies. Mazaros, the 20-year-old, could be worth it just for the fact. I mean, he's going to be in the 60s. Tristan Lynch? As a defenseman, what about Coleco? Do we have Coleco vision? We will find out. And unfortunately, no one else is looking that good. Uh, Nolan Rudder, or Rooter perhaps, and Teamander, not looking that great. Hello, Voinoff. He's 19 and it's gonna take him forever to develop, but, I don't know, we don't have forever to wait, <laughs> but, he could be worth it. Par Erickson, Thomas Herme, and Green, Peyton Green. All right. We got a lot of players on the board here. Okay, so Voinoff is way the hell down there. Goaltending, screw that. Screw that. How many other players do we have here? Jesus, I pinned a lot of players. Okay. So, first step, double checking. B's and C's, the potential A in shooting for Fairchild. How did he do scoring-wise? Not as well. Another goalie in Jacobs. Again, screw that. Smoskowitz. Oh, kind of a tough call. Coleco. Also kind of a tough call. So, I mean, we have guys listed in the 60s and 70s, of course. Voinoff, we should be able to get in that, in that next round. So, I'd like to think we can avoid taking him here. It's just whether or not we can uh, make up our mind on one of these other players, to be honest. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to. So, Tristan Lynch, as a defenseman, is interesting at least. Le Perrier, the 18-year-old, decent goal scoring. Again, I can't help but think I'm looking at forwards here, because none of these defensemen really won me over as being can't miss. So we'll take them off the list and it's going to be a forward heavy draft, especially with our uh, lack of goal scoring in this most recent draft. We're also getting low on time. So let's see, anything crazy. B's and C's, a potential A there. Right now it's Fairchild, who's the favorites. Antilla is the favorites. It's Antilla or Le Perrier. It's going to be uh, Marku Antilla. From the Vasho Lakers. Low 662. Alright. 
Not anything special, unfortunately, as far as whether or not there was a can't-miss player. I'm looking more at potentials here than overalls. Laperia wasn't even that good, so... I guess technically we made the right choice. In total, I mean, some low forward defensemen. Hedstrom was a medium elite goalie. But, yeah, it's not looking like the strongest draft. It's just not. So I think overall, there was no wrong choice. Jacobs was a medium elite, but I don't care. He's a 57. Yeah, I mean, we made the right choice out of all the players we were considering. It's still rough, though. As Coleco is still available... But, I don't know, I'm not overly sold on him. And as far as anybody else, I know the gem is there, but that potential is not gem-worthy. Demander, and then Voinov. So let's look here beyond Voinov. Is there anybody else? We looked at Erickson and Herme. We have a complete unknown. Hamill? No. What about Peyton Green, who we had on the list before? There's got to be somebody, right? Medium top four defenseman in Barry Foss. 18 years old at least, he might be worth it. Pojar at center? Caden Pojar? C is and D is. If he was guaranteed as an elite, that would work. A medium top six in Ezra Hay. 18 at least, even though the grades aren't that good. It would give him time to develop. Gordon Hickey. Dante Ocapozo. It's, it's not looking like a best, you know, the best draft or a great draft for steals, unfortunately. Jared Perez, not looking that good. This is brutal. Petrovitsky. Eh, he's okay. Preston Fistrich. He's 19, so I'd expect him to be a little bit better. Uh, Calvin Woodworth and Theodore Krupp. Could also be worth it. The German defenseman. Again, though, I still haven't seen that one guy where I'm like, yep, he's the player to pick. Spike Altshuler. Definitely isn't the guy <laughs> as a grinder, although maybe that's what we're missing. Shannon Kearns, not looking that good. Denny Pepe, not looking that good. DeFazio, this is a poor draft from all outward looks. This is a poor, poor draft. Nathaniel Smith might be the guy. He's 19, so he's an overager, but it could be worth it. What about Emmanuel Haskins? No real guarantee either. The medium four in Karinen, if that could be trusted, which from the looks of it, it cannot be. Roger Lutz. Two B minuses there. Ridiculous grades for that backup goalie, but that's to be expected. Yeah, this is, this is awful. This is absolutely awful for anybody expected to be drafted here anytime soon. So as far as the pinned players that we have, it's uh, it's got to be Voinov. Nobody else can compete with that. I don't think anybody else was in a position to compete with that outside of Foss. I'd rather go for Voinov. So we will take the 6'4 Belarusian. He is a 56 overall, 19 years old, was it? Yeah, so... He is certainly one of those toss-ups where if he develops, cool. Do I expect him to? Not really. But I guess when we have this late of a draft pick, we really can't hope for much. Foss is still available, so I'm probably just going to take him or Hay. One of the two. I mean, we at least know what they are as opposed to the other two. So Hay was 18, C's and D's, or basically majority D's. Foss wasn't that good either. We need the forward more. Emmanuel Hay. Let's do it. The Denmark native is a 51. Yikes. So there goes the dream of having a strong team coming out of this draft. I don't know if any of these players will eventually factor in. I mean, we're going to start by looking at the uh, top of the board now in terms of potentials. So in terms of the unknown medium elites, Svedberg... Majority C's might not be that bad. Haskins could be worth it. McKenzie, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a grinder with that physical category. He's also 20, so unless, if he's not higher than the 65, he's not worth it. And then Gunnarsson. So, I mean, we have the players at the top of the list. 
And then our three confirmed low elites includes this grinder Tarasov. Which, you know, could be worth it. I think that's that's all we can do at this point. Is just take a risk with these guys. Nathaniel Smith might be my next pick. Just because of those Bs that could make him worth it. Because in terms of grades, we're not seeing anybody else. What about Karainen? Nothing. Alright, so we'll just take the risk here. And the best grades from the looks of it, we're going to go for Nathaniel Smith. He's not a guaranteed low elite, but we can hope for the best. He is a low 664. Yikes. Yikes, that was really weird. What the hell happened there? Sheesh. Did the game black out for a second? <laughs> Alright, let's see what we got. I gotta be honest, I mean the low elites are nice, but man, their overalls are gonna be so rough. Are there any unconfirmed medium nines? No, there's not, outside of Olsen. This is such a bad draft. Oh my god. Thank God we didn't postpone the rebuild any later than we did, or this is what we'd be dealing with. Granted, the top half of the draft would be better, but in terms of like, you know, the end of the draft, there's nothing. There's nothing. So we're going to go between the low elites. Tarasov is the gem. He's the one forward left. Let's take the 19-year-old uh, Lithuanian, I do believe, Tarasov, the 59 overall. And we'll take one of those two defensemen here at the end if either are still available, which I would expect them to be. Let's see what we got. See what we got, indeed. So is it Eminger or Spotcheck? Eminger is younger. It's Eminger. So from the Sioux Greyhounds, we'll take Chandler Eminger. He's a 54. And that concludes a pretty poor draft in terms of overalls. I mean, we end up with some decent players when it comes to uh, potential. But, yeah, overall, that is a pretty poor draft. And that sets up... A very interesting offseason. We got a lot of turnover as far as scouts are concerned. But just with what this roster is going to look like, it's another year of not knowing what's going to happen to Voinov. If we look at the goaltending situation, we're still set. It's going to be Ockerland and Connor Walchuk as the 1 2. Fox needs to be re signed. And I mean, I can handle that right now. He's going nowhere because otherwise we don't have a fifth goaltender. Granted, injuries aren't on, but still. It at least makes it interesting. So those are the four. There is severe doubt around Ackerland at this point. Hopefully he can prove to be the man because Connor Walchuk is an RFA, as is Van Allen. We're more than likely at the end of next season to maybe get something for Connor Walchuk. But at this point, I think we just have to hope that he's the one if Ackerland isn't. Defensively, of course, we don't have to worry about Zeeler anymore. Uh, Vorobioff will need to be re-signed. I'm not going to do anything else money-wise. And then Eminger is our only unsigned defensive prospect. So you can see, like, we're all in with this current squad. This is it. Like, out of this group, we need to have the six defensemen that are going to lead this club into the future. Obviously, Fisher is not going to. So between Conacher and Up and Eminger, it needs to be this group that we're winning a cup with or we're not winning a cup at all. And forward-wise, of course, the Ivanov contract will have sorted. That's not an issue. Moroz needs a new deal. Melnick, Yang, I mean, it's going to be interesting to sort out this roster. we got a lot of fringe players right now. Uh, someone like Ivani, who will probably be dropped. Stewart will probably be signed just to give him a chance. It's going to be very interesting to see who makes the cut and what this team looks like moving forward. But I am going to end the episode here because I got another video to record and I got the uh, slider set to sort out for the roster editing spectacular. And hopefully, maybe, I can get that video done today too. If not, keep an eye out for it. Thank you guys for watching. I do greatly appreciate it. It's funny because on the stream I was doing, it was a late night stream slash early morning stream uh, where people got to talking about, as they uh, do somewhat frequently, how long they've been, you know, watching what I've been doing for, and it's still stupid to me. Like, it was stupid to me then that people were watching, and it's still stupid to me now that people are watching. But I love you for it. Check out everything in the description if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in the next one where, again, setting up the roster, potentially getting the season going as well, as long as there isn't a major decision to be made.